majority segment within the 1 billion poor living under 1.25 US dollars a day, while a vast majority of world's poor are still living. Women producing 60 to 80 percent food play a major role in ensuring food security. Yet, women farmers are often invisible. Access to credit, capital, land, assets and resources, ownership of productive assets is a major component where we need to work if we want to ensure economic empowerment. The other aspect is access to market. They produce goods in different parts of the rural areas everywhere, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan, South Asia, but they don't have any means of you know, allowing their goods to get into the markets. So how do For women. So what's going to be very interesting is uh, the proportional seats, which is 110, to make up for that 33% uh, compulsory uh, you know, membership of women, you need to appoint, I think, about 85 Competition. So it's going to be extremely interesting, I think, uh, uh, for the less than a year, I think for the initial few terms of Parliament, uh, this kind of a constitutional guarantee will lead to uh, quite transformative changes in my opinion. Now, um, there's almost full complete parity in primary education, secondary education, and tertiary education. Uh, sometimes once these things are set in motion, almost impossible to reverse and that's, that's where the legal and uh, the constitutional and the Gender Thinking about how we can increase India's female labor force participation or economic empowerment, economic activity, it's a very complex issue. We underappreciate is the role that the policies, economic policies and programs themselves can actually have in the role that women play in the economy and they can actually change and shift uh, the social and cultural factor, cultural factors surrounding women's economic don't the dialogue is just being an event. You know, surely there's a lot of conversation that will happen here tonight and also tomorrow, but we hope that lots of connections will be made that can be taken forward. New potential collaborations, new project opportunities. Our team at EPOD really hopes to help foster these. We see this regional dialogue as a unique opportunity to focus on the similarities and differences in how men and women engage with economic opportunities across uh, South Asia and what is the role of social and cultural norms in shaping this engagement. One unique feature that we see across a significant fraction of South Asia is uh, constraints on women's mobility. Uh, roughly half of India's rural women still state that they require permission from a family member even to go to the local market or the health center. And in the end, it's pretty difficult to get a job if you can't leave the house without asking someone else. Each female worker is literally responsible for at least four other family members of the family. So there's a huge empowerment that is actually happening. Um, so Bangladesh is a success story. Um, and the best part is um, there's no discrimination in wages. Um, we can't even ask our workers whether they're pregnant when we recruit them. So, you know, the rules are all in place. And um, being a woman makes all the difference in the trade. Uh, very recently, I've, I've humbly um, uh, suggested to my uh, industry leaders that, you know, when we have trade unions or workers' participatory committees, we should have more female representation at least 50% because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Um, as far as the company goes, um, being a woman uh, owner makes, again, a difference. Uh, being a female entrepreneur and, and leading all these women, I think it's the most gratifying job that I could have ever dreamt of. But I think just having um, a woman leader in itself, as we've already heard from these wonderful ladies, uh, makes a difference. I think it creates um, a sort of a safety net and, and, and makes, I think gives it a, gives an assurance to women, uh, even if you don't deliberately, deliberately say it, but I think they know that there is someone else who will 
can empathize and would hear them out of nothing else, whether you do something or not, they don't even think about that. But the fact that they have someone they can talk to who would give them the ear, I think that in itself makes a huge difference. Uh, the first thing that I actually did was I actually went door to door. I knew what the issues were, but I wanted to understand what the <coughs> residents wanted and what they thought was priority because that's how I wanted to work. I didn't want it to be a top-down approach, but make them realize that I'm there for them and we have to make uh, things work together. So also to get them to take ownership and participate, which was something they were not used to. So uh, again, why? By seeing that I was able to do things differently, I was able to deliver it in spite of being a woman, also empowered many parents. And a lot of parents started sending their daughters, and not just daughters, but even daughters-in-law, <coughs> to schools and colleges. And um, that was beautiful to see. And a lot of uh, women, especially young girls from other villages, other panchayats, who would call me up if they had a problem, they never met me. But they had this belief that if they spoke to me, I would definitely speak to their parents and convince their parents to let me study if they wanted to study or work if they wanted to work. And luckily for me, just very recently, uh, in the village, I've uh, had the option to take over a girls' college. So this college, when I just took over last year, only had 300 girls. But now that people know that I've taken over, I've actually got 600 students as of today. And also, um, in terms of, um, you know, generally things getting better, women's increasing labor force has not translated into increased uh, control, uh, increased um, resources and increased control over resources also. Uh, they do get better education, it does not translate into jobs. Um, I, recently I think the labor force survey showed that less than 1% women fell in the category of the highly educated and professional uh, women. Whereas the number we know of, for example, of medical graduates uh, is about over 60% in uh, Pakistan. So where are these women going? The solution to this problem then the commission set out to get, get gathering evidence on its own and uh, I think created I think uh, what is one of the first gender MIS's management information systems and that's the good news from Pakistan that the census has begun you know and we have some idea of where we're headed. For example for the first time uh, land holding by women was measured by the provincial government in Punjab and we found out that 30% of the landholders in rural areas were women. Now, were they in control of their lands and the produce from it? We don't see that, you know. But it does tell you that there is space to intervene, you know, and there is some, uh, some progress that can be made from there. Change, again, change cannot uh, be expected in one day, one night. The first amendment took place in 2002 that says, oh, daughter, is a equal right, uh, daughter has equal right to inheritance, but once she marries, she has to um, return the property. And secondly, then what happened? No, we said, no, movement uh, rights have no border and movement has no end. So we continued our struggle and in 2000, um, six, the second amendment said, no, once you inherit, you don't have to return the property. The latest amendment said, whether you are married or married, there's no discrimination based on the marital status, so everyone has equal right. And now this has also been guaranteed in the new constitution.